Mistaken identity. Um, here's the thought. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Um, what, who you are determines what you do. It's, it's kind of an identity thing. We were singing here at the Wellsville campus, Good, Good Father, because we know that we have a good, good father and we're a child of the Most High God. It kind of dictates how we can go about you know, issues of forgiveness and getting past our past because we have a good father that loves us and it, it kind of propels us into the future because whenever you understand who you are in Christ, it'll all, always determine and propel you to be what you are in Christ. That's the, the key thought today. Um, kind of give you a little humorous illustration of this. My son Josiah, three weeks ago, was on stage after the service. And Josiah, is, if you're wondering who Josiah is, he's the two-year-old, red-headed, curly-haired, Ronald McDonald kid in our church, okay? So if you see a curly two, two-year-old, red-headed kid, goofy kid, that's Jojo. Uh, I like Josiah. Don't call him George. Call him Jojo or Josiah, okay? But after the service, he gets up on stage, and he's doing his thing. Josiah's got rhythm, okay? And when you got rhythm, what do you do? You dance. And so they had some music going on after the service, and this is going to prove my point. Go ahead and show Josiah. Let's get a clap for him. And there's Luke in the background, Luke Taylor. Whoa, don't fall off the edge there. And then he starts pounding his chest. I, we're just going to watch the whole thing. Watch it. Ready for it? Good job, Luke. I love that boy. We got some talented dancers in our church, don't we? See, when you got rhythm, like Josiah, when, when JoJo's got rhythm, he just does what he does. You know, that's what he does. Me, on the other hand, I don't have as much. I'm not sure where he got it from. Actually, I got some pretty corny moves, too, I can bust out. But uh, anyways, um, I think it was last week, Pastor Andy uh, gave the, the message, and he showed a picture, and I had told him I was already using that picture as an example, but he went and used it anyway of me lying on a bench. And I'm not sure what he used it for, but here's, here's my illustration. This was moments after me participating in a group fitness class led by my wife. It's called Body Pump. Pretty sure you, you should get a doctor's recommendation before taking it. Uh, that's not true. Anybody can do it. Not true either. But um, I guess you got to be in somewhat shape to do this. And if only I knew who I was, <laughs> I would not have done what I did. Because I've heard people say on Facebook, oh, he's just resting. Oh, he's sleeping on the job and blah, 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 blah. No, this is me actually on my deathbed. Like, I'm not joking. Like, moments before this, Pastor Andy was talking to me, saying something. I had no idea what he was saying. I'm buried in my, my knees, and he's talking away. And at some point, I checked out, and I said, I'm done with this conversation. <laughs> I was like, I got to throw up. I'm shaking. I learned a very valuable lesson. I am allergic to group fitness, okay? <laughs> I Put me on the treadmill for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, and some lates, but not that. I might try it again just because I love my wife, but she was begging me for like weeks and months to try this out, and so that was, I was trying to be supportive. It didn't work out too good. But here's the point. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Say that with me. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Who you are determines what you do, and how, how important is that as Christians to understand who we are in Christ? Because if you understand who you are in Christ, and if you can get beyond just being saved and and understanding salvation comes through Christ alone, it's grace by faith, I get that. But when you get beyond that and understand who you truly are in Christ, it will determine what you do for Christ. And I think the problem is in our culture, we have too many Christians that really haven't gotten beyond that fact and beyond that scope, and so they don't really know who they are in Christ, and therefore they really don't understand what they should be doing for Christ. It's an identity issue, or we could say, as we're doing in the series, a mistaken identity. Um, here's another example. After church, sometimes we have a fellowship dinner, lunch, and uh, there's been plenty of times where people you know, gather for the food. Anytime we gather for a church dinner, maybe this is true in your life too, anytime you gather for a group lunch or dinner, isn't there one person in the group that gets asked to, to pray, to bless the meal? Who, who's that one person? You ever, are you that one person? Well, whenever we gather together as a church to have a meal, guess who gets asked to pray for the blessing? Why? Because I'm the 
I'm the pastor, and before, this is the days before Pastor John uh, came on staff and, and the other pastors, uh, we would have like a luncheon after words, and um, I'd get caught up talking to a guest out in the foyer. It would be like 15, 20 minutes go by, and I'm just talking away, answering questions, greeting people, and everybody's starting to congregate downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. This is for our Wellsville campus, but we gather down in the Fellowship Hall to eat. And I eventually get down there about 20 minutes later, and, and guess what I find? No one's eating. <laughs> no one ate. They're just like waiting around for me to get down there to bless their food. And it's like, I had this thought one day, y'all would starve without me. You know, you just wouldn't ever eat. <laughs> if I never got downstairs, and thankfully, you know, we got other people to pray now, but I'm just thinking in my head, like, why don't you pray? Why can't you pray? And the, the, the thought is, well, you're the pastor. You're the super Christian. I'm just a regular Christian. I can't do that. And I'm poking a little bit of fun, but isn't that true? Not necessarily with praying for food, but isn't that true sometimes how we approach faith issues, how we approach ministry opportunities, how we are feeling called by God to step out in faith and do something extraordinary, or feeling called by God to bless someone in need, but we don't know what to say, don't know how to say it, kind of an awkward situation. And the thought is, those are for the super Christians. I'm just a regular Christian. Here's the one big problem with that when we're talking about mistaken identity. It's because you don't know who you are in Christ that dictates your lack of ability to move forward and press onto those issues. Because if we truly understood who we are in Christ, we would understand there's nothing regular about us. The Bible says that the same spirit, think about this, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I mean, there's nothing regular about that. There's nothing regular about us as individual Christians having access to the throne room of God. There's nothing regular about us having authority in Christ, but yet too many Christians fail to realize their identity in Christ, and therefore, because they don't know who they are, they don't know what to do for God. And so that's why we're going to talk over the next several weeks about our identity in Christ and how that should propel us to move forward in our relationship with him. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. Um, well, if you have your Pew Bible, you can turn to page 966. Uh, if you have your regular Bible, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. And it's probably a pretty familiar passage of scripture for some people. And uh, here's what Paul says. And if you're not there yet, you can just follow along on the screen. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Simply means if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're in Christ, the old is gone, meaning your sin, your shame, past mistakes even, what you wish you could have done with your life but you didn't do, past regrets, all that's gone. And when you step into faith in Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him, there's this, there's this new identity. You're a new creation. And all new creations have new purposes, when you become something new, you have a new identity, a new purpose, new desires, that your desires as a Christian becomes Jesus' desires and vice versa. You want to do what Jesus does, not what you wish you would have done. That's the picture of baptism. When you go underneath the water, you leave your old life behind. When you come up out of the water, that's this new identity, and new identities have new purposes. Think about it this way. Think about the amazing transformation that you have in Christ. And it's not, I'm not saying that you're perfect from day one and it's just this total transformation. It's this instant sanctification that you have. It's a process, but there is that sense of old and new, old and new. And think about it this way in nature's terms. Think about a caterpillar turned butterfly. There's this amazing process that takes place in this cocoon and out comes this butterfly. And imagine this butterfly with wings who is made to beautifully fly through the air starts crawling on the ground. You look at it and say, that doesn't make sense. And I think that's what God would say to his people. He'd say, well, that doesn't make sense. You're in Christ. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You should have a new purpose, new identity, new desires. But yet we just crawl along on the ground, not understanding who we are in Christ. Yes. So verse 18. Verse 18 says this. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us. We're going to talk about that word reconciled us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses or, or sins, is another word, against them, and entrusting to us the message of what? Reconciliation. Um, 
I'm not assuming anything, but if you're a follower of Christ, and I know we probably have people here that haven't made that commitment yet, but if you're a follower of Christ at any of our locations, what I want to say is you're in the us. You're in the us. Like you're included in that. And you may have walked in this morning thinking, I don't got a ministry. No, you do. You didn't know it. You, you signed up when you became a Christian for the ministry of reconciliation. Welcome to the ministry team of reconciliation. You're, you're a part of the us, and this is your responsibility. You say, okay, well, if it's my responsibility, what is it? Um, reconciliation is kind of a big you know, churchy word. Well, reconciliation is simply being brought back into right relationship with God. And I think we get that. We've all done things in our past that we weren't proud of. We sinned. We've fallen short of God's perfection, and we drift, you know, we drift away. We wander from God's perfect plan. Reconciliation, because sin separates us from a perfect God, is God, God, not us, God bringing us back into a right relationship with God so we, we can say he's a good, good father and I'm his child. That's what reconciliation is. God does that, so what does that mean for us? When Paul says he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, what he's essentially saying is, when you became a Christian, you signed up for the ministry team of reconciliation, which means you got to put on new lenses, new glasses, and when you go through Monday through Saturday, and you walk in your regular world, and you rub shoulders with people who don't know Christ, you got to be empathetic and open to their brokenness and see them for who God sees them and do whatever you got to do, make that conversation, open up to them, serve them, love on them, and point them to Jesus Christ. That is our ministry. It's the ministry known as what? Reconciliation. It's so crucial that we understand this because, again, if you don't understand that, you won't do it. And I don't know what the latest statistics are, but it's, it's pretty pathetic. The percentage of Christians within the local church of America that actually share their faith in any type of thing. I'm not talking about with a megaphone or getting up in front of people on a pulpit, but any type of sharing your faith, witnessing, reaching out, sharing the love of Christ, sharing your testimony of what God has done, it's such a low percentage. Why is that? I think it's that, I think that's being reluctant to understand who we are in Christ, that as a Christian, we have to embrace this idea that we were saved when we least expected it and least deserved it. That's called grace, and we need to extend that grace to other people when they least expect it and least deserve it. That's Part of our story, we got to do that, ripples of grace. Here's what else it says in verse 20. This is kind of where we're going to land on for the rest of the message. It's kind of the theme and the the title of my sermon, uh, Mistaken Identity, I Am an Ambassador. This is it. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, so to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I love where it says God making his appeal through us. I mean, if you're God, do you need to use human beings to communicate the message of reconciliation? You really don't. You really could use any form of communication that is available at your disposal, but somehow, some way, he chooses Ordinary people to do something extraordinary. He uses people who don't really feel like they have it in them, don't really feel like they know what to say, to do something incredible for someone to step across that line of faith and believe in Jesus Christ. He chose you and gave you the opportunity and privilege to be able to be a part of that. You are a what? You are an ambassador. That's part of your identity. You might say, well, what's an ambassador? We put it on the screen for you, just kind of give you a definition. It's the highest ranking diplomat sent as a representative from one country to another. You know that. You've heard of diplomats and ambassadors to other countries before. All it is is it's it's the highest-ranking diplomat sent as a representative from one country to another. They don't represent their own interests. They simply are representative of their own government. I'll use uh, Pastor Stu as an example since he's going to Senegal in October. Um, If you want to put that flag and map up, that's kind of where Pastor Stu will be in in West Africa. And... um, here, here we are as a church, which I just think this is neat, and perhaps in the future we can send mission teams to Senegal. Part of what he's doing is actually going with, I don't know, five or six other pastors as sort of a vision trip to kind of get an idea of what God's doing in West Africa and Senegal and Mali to bring that vision back so that perhaps we can maybe send people in the future, which would be great. But we're sending Pastor Stu, and he's our highest diplomat at this point. We said, go, Stu. You're willing, go. Our district's paying for the whole thing, which is awesome. Um, But he goes over there. He's not representing his own agenda. He's probably got no agenda. He's just excited to to do what God wants him to do. But how cool is it that 
we as Crosstown get to sort of commission him out to be an ambassador for Christ. And maybe in the future, other people are an ambassador. He's going to go to Africa for about 10 days and hopefully he'll come back. Pastor Stu's wife, Amy, Dylan and Nicole, his two kids, probably want him back. Why? Because that's not his home, is it? His home is in Franklinville, and his church is in Arcade, and he just happens to be a representative from one country to the next, which is also true if we can go from Stu to you. You like that transition? If we can go to Stu to you, at some point you need to see yourself as an ambassador as well, where you carry the message of Jesus to a foreign land, a land that's not your home, a culture that's not your home. Heaven is your home, and God sent you from heaven to earth to be an ambassador for him to the people that are in your circle of influence. A few weeks ago, Pastor Sue talked about that in his sermon, using our influence, don't wasting our influence. And he gave you that diagram. Remember that that diagram with all the circles? Were you guys here? Becky was here, good. We had one person in the sanctuary. Woo! (laughs) And so you filled out, Becky, you filled out those circles, and you put all the names in those circles, and you had family circle, you had friend circle, you had coworker circle, you had all these circles. Those were your circle of influence. And, and God would want to tell you this morning is, congratulations, you are an ambassador to those circles. That's who you were sent to, not to represent your own agenda, but to represent God. You are an ambassador. A um, couple thoughts. Again, when you know who you are in Christ, you'll know what to do for Christ. Uh, first thought is this today. You were appointed and chosen not by others, but by God. You were appointed and chosen not by others, but by God. You represent him. I think that's so crucial to understand. I think so many of us kind of get caught in fear where we don't step out in faith and do what God's calling us to do. We're a little timid, don't know what to say. It's a little nerve-wracking to go outside of our comfort zone. And I think somewhere along the way, we've gotten our permission, our authority, our acceptance from other people. Whether they say, you can't do this because of this. You can't do this because of your past. How, how would you ever see yourself as an ambassador if you know little about the Bible or you have this in your past and you made mistakes in your past that disqualifies you? Listen, your identity doesn't come from those other people. Your identity comes in Christ. And if he looks at you and says, you're an ambassador, guess what? You're an ambassador. That's who you are. That's your identity. And because you know who you are, it'll dictate what you do in those situations. And isn't it great to know that you were appointed and chosen by others, not by others, but by God? Where do I get this? Uh, John chapter 15, look what it says here. You did not choose me, Jesus says to his disciples, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. I chose you and appointed you. You are an ambassador. Um, you're not what other people say you are. You're who God says you are. Nothing more, that's pride, nothing less. That's not understanding your true identity. Because when you understand who you are in Christ, you'll know what to do for Christ. And there's gonna be days where you don't feel equipped. There's gonna be days where you don't feel like an ambassador. There's gonna be days where you don't feel like you could do much good for God. But in those days, here's, I, want, I want you to remember what Cheryl uh, Gelder said. I don't know if you've watched the, the documentary. She said something really cool. She's a... Um, a tender at our Olean campus, Cheryl Gelder is. She was on the launch team for Olean. She was on the launch team for Arcade. And she said these words in the documentary that I'll never forget. And I'm pretty sure she got them from somewhere else. But she said, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. That even though there might be days where you don't feel like God can use you, it doesn't matter. God doesn't call the equipped. In other words, he doesn't call perfect people. In fact, we could say there's no perfect people allowed in our church because there's none. We're, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. But when you're called to do something and if your identity is in Christ and if your identity is to be an ambassador to reach out to your circle of influence, he'll equip you. He'll give you the words to say. He'll give you the opportunity to use. And he'll give you the strength and boldness to act in those situations because God doesn't call the equipped. He, calls, um, he equips the call. I think if you internalize this, it makes all the difference in the world. We think about probably the greatest example that I could think of is the Apostle Paul. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but the same guy that wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the, the guy who said, uh, therefore we are now ambassadors for Christ as if God was making his appeal through us. The guy who literally planted you know, all these churches around the Mediterranean rim, wrote 13 books of the New Testament, like we're here because of him, 
was probably the least likely candidate to be used by God. Why do I say that? Well, because he was a terrorist. Basically, he killed Christians in the early church. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He kills, not only does he kill him, he's holding the coats of people who are, are murdering um, Stephen in, in Acts chapter 9. And there's this whole long story that you can read about, but essentially, um, Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And he has this encounter with Christ that literally changed his life forever. He's got this huge past, offending God, killing Christians. God changes his life, and the least likely person to be used by God has this moment with Christ that literally changes everything. He's told to go into the city, and again, you can read about it. But there's this other Christian named Ananias. And Ananias was told to go minister to Saul. And your reaction would probably be the same as my reaction, which was the same as Ananias, which is, what? <laughs> I'm not going to talk to him. Like, he kills people. He kills Christians. I'm not talking. And God says this to Ananias in Acts chapter 9. I love these words. He says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he, Paul, Saul, who turned Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The guy who probably was the least likely candidate was used by God as a chosen instrument to do what? To carry the name of Jesus before people who did not know him. That's what an ambassador is. That's what an ambassador does. And I would just tell you today that you are God's chosen instrument, chosen by God to play the melody of God's grace to the people around you, to literally let that, that ripples of grace just spread because of what God's done in your life. Yeah. And the, the, the cool thing about this is that when we understand that we are an instrument and not the musician, it literally changes your perspective. For example, Tim let me touch his guitar earlier in the first service, so I think it'd be okay for the second service. Now, how many of you know I play a mean guitar? Not true. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, if, if I got up here and you say, this is your instrument, you got, it all depends on you, and we're gonna I'm going to lead you in worship today. It ain't going to go well. No one's going to sing. You all leave next week. You ain't coming back. This is why we have gifted musicians up here. Um, but but here, here's the thing. I don't have to be the rock star. All I have to be is the guitar. All I am is an instrument in the hands of God. And thankfully... What's playing your tune is not me, it's God. And thankfully, what's playing your tune is not you, it's, it's God. God will put the opportunities in your path. He'll put the people in your path. He'll give you the words that you need to say when you need to say it. He'll give you the strength when you need it. All you got to do is be used by the master musician. You're just the instrument. But as you begin to embrace that, doesn't that, doesn't that give you tremendous confidence how many of you have ever had to speak in front of people? Just show of hands. And the other people <laughs> don't even want to try it, right? Isn't it a little terrifying? Yeah. I mean, I remember getting like, I think probably my first speech class, I got like, a, I think I failed actually. Uh, I, I did a horrible grade. I never wanted to get up in, in front of people and speak. And each and every week, I'm nervous. Like, I, I get nervous before I come up here. It's terrifying to, to be able to speak. And, and hope you got something that makes sense half the time and hope, hope people listen. But every single week, I'm just reminded, you're, whether it was th this week, I'm God's chosen instrument. Last week, Pastor Andy was God's chosen instrument. The week before that, Pastor Stu was God's chosen instrument. It ain't relying on me to do what, you know, all, the, all the special gifts and all. It's just being in God's presence and allowing him to speak through you. That same com Getting up here and having that confidence that you're just the instrument is so beneficial, and it's so beneficial in your life when God asks you to step out in your workplace, to have that conversation with your friend, and to, to do this deed for someone that's going to be a little bit intimidating. Know that your confidence comes from Christ, that he chose you, he appointed you, you're the instrument, just let him play that music through you. Does that make sense? It, it changes everything when you understand that perspective. That's the first thought. The second thought is this. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whenever it is, you're always representing Christ. Wherever you go, you're always representing Christ. When you're at home with the kids, you're representing Christ. When you're at the work and you're driving to work, I use my sister as an example 
at the earlier service, this was before she, I guess, knew Jesus, but I remember a moment we were in the car together. I was a senior in high school, and uh, she did not represent Jesus very well. Let me just put it like that. We were late to our basketball tournament, and somehow, some way, she got me from Wilson, New York to Ontario, Canada in like record time, passing people, telling them they're number one. And uh, <laughs> it was horrible. And it was just like, I'm, this is like early on in my life with Jesus. And I'm just like, <laughs> but I don't have a Jesus bumper sticker on the car or something. But wherever you go, wherever you go, wherever you go, you're always representing Christ. That's what ambassadors do. You go from one country to another, not representing your agenda, but the government agenda that sent you. And for us as Christians, it's God's government. It's the kingdom of God, which means everything you do is, is important. Nothing that you do in life, even though it might feel mundane and it might just feel like it's not important, has no significance. That's a lie from the enemy. Everything that you do represents Christ. So how you do what you do and the reasons why you do what you do and having integrity in why you do what you do is so important because you represent Christ. That's what it means to be an ambassador. Let me, let me share uh, one final story um, before we close. Um, it's from this book I, I got, I think I told you about a couple weeks ago, at least here in Wellsville I did. It's called Ch uh, Chase the Lion. It's by a guy named Mark Batterson, who's one of my favorite authors. He's a pastor of a church in Washington, D.C. that we got to visit while I was on my sabbatical. And um, Mark wrote a book called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. How's that for a title? In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. I remember when we were in Texas in 2008, we were at uh, a mall, Katie Mills Mall, which is this huge mall, and we would literally just go there to waste time on a Friday, like it was just a cool hangout. They had like bass fishing shop with all these different things, and they had this bookstore that we'd always like to go into with this train, and Aiden would play at the train, and we would just look at books, and there's this one book that I came across one day, and it drew my attention because it said, in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. I'm like, huh. And I picked it up, and I just started reading through it, and that was one of the books that God used to bring us up from Texas to New York to pastor a church, it was, it was life-changing. It kind of just challenged me to step out and step up and trust God that he was gonna do something in our lives, and so we did, and loved the book. We got a chance to meet him at this service when we went to Washington, D.C. It was a Saturday night service, so it was very low-key. I went up and shook his hand, and Aaron and I were talking, and we were sharing our story that it was so influential that we actually named our second son, Ethan, after the main guy that he wrote about, Benaiah, which was one of David's Mighty Men, Benaiah was the main character of the story, and so it's Ethan Benaiah Gorham, and he's like, I got a deal for you. Anybody who names their son after Benaiah, whether first name or middle name, I send them a copy of my book, and I, I transcribe it, I sign it for them. So two weeks later from our trip, he uh, sent me this book and signed it, and I, I probably, I read it in like three days, it was so cool. There's one story though as I was preparing for this message that I thought would be great to share when we're talking about being an ambassador, carrying the name of Jesus, and maybe not understanding what we do has any significance at this moment, but years later we see that come to fruition. He tells the story of a, a guy named J.W. Tucker. He was a missionary to the Congo, and I don't know if you've heard of this guy before. J.W. Tucker in 1964 uh, was serving as a missionary to the Congo when he was brutally beaten with broken bottles uh, by these Congo rebels. And the, the rebels took him and some of about 60 other people and they threw him into the Bomokandi, which I think I'm saying it right, river that was filled with alligators. And he got eaten alive, lost his life. He was pretty young at that moment in his life. And I think the natural reaction when you hear that story is to feel bad for J.W. Tucker because his life seemingly got cut short. And I love Mark's insight. He says, he says this. He says, life can't be cut short when it lasts for all eternity. And you know, it's that eternal perspective. And then he, he, he said this, and I, was, I wrote wow in my margin of my book. He said, if we could covet in heaven, if we could covet in heaven, we would covet the martyr's reward. You know, if you could covet in heaven, if you could sin in heaven, I guess, you would covet the martyr's reward because of how much they have been used by God. Seemingly, when things are lost, they died, God uses that. That's how the church grew and grew and grew and grew. That's why we're here. It's because Tucker knew who he was and he knew whose he was that allowed him to lay down his will 
and to embrace the Father's will for his life. And he said, how can I die if I'm already dead to myself? How can I die when I'm already dead to myself? His friends, before he went to the Congo, there was a civil war going on. They said, don't go, don't go, don't go. They were trying to convince him not to go. And they said, if you go in, you'll never come out. To which he responded, I love these words, he said, God didn't tell me I had to come out. He only told me I had to go in. And he gave his life for the gospel. His wife and his kids went from Africa, or uh, the Congo, to where they were, and uh, flew home. And she writes this beautiful prayer in the book, essentially questioning, or at least praying, that God would use his death for the Lord's glory. And so this is how the story concludes. Oh, I missed my page. Here we are. Mark says, for 30 years it seemed like J.W.'s Tucker's sacrifice was all for naught. But God answered his widow's prayer in a unique way. The Bomokandi River flows through the middle of an unreached people group called the Magbitu tribe. During a time of civil unrest, the Magbitu king appealed to his government for help. They sent a man known as the Brigadier, a policeman that J.W. Tucker had led to the Lord two months before he was killed. His efforts to share the gospel with the Megbitu failed until he discovered an ancient tribal tradition, which this is where the story gets interesting. The tradition goes like this. If the blood of any man flows in the Bomokandi River, you must listen to his message. The brigadier gathered the village elders and told them of a man whose blood flowed in the river. He said, some time ago a man was killed and his body was thrown into your River. The crocodiles in this river ate him up and his blood flowed in your river. But before he died, he left me a message. And this message concerns God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this world to save people who were sinners. He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins. I received this message and it changed my life. And this is the result. Several members of the tribe fell on their knees, surrendering their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And since that day, thousands upon thousands of Bagbitu have come to faith in Christ. And there are dozens of churches in that region because of one man whose blood flowed in the Bomakandi River. And then he says, it's not for naught. It never is. Even when you feel like your dream is dead in the water, even when you feel like the seed that you cast isn't producing any fruit, even when you feel like that awkward conversation had no significance, even when you wake up and got to go to work again at a dead-end job and you're not seeing the significance, God is using that. It's never for naught. It never is. And to tie back what I said at the beginning of the message, there's no such thing as a regular Christian. You just simply fail to understand who you are in Christ because when you understand who you are, it'll determine what you do. You might not be a missionary to the Congo. You might not go with Pastor Stu in the future to, the, to West Africa. Hope you do, but you might not. You might not be any of those things. You might just be a stay-at-home mom. But you're not just any stay-at-home mom. You're literally raising the next generation of Christ followers. You might be a student. I want to say this to the high school students, middle school students. You're not just any student. You're an ambassador for Christ. And the one thing I don't think our young people get nowadays is there will never, ever be a time in your life where you'll be surrounded by people who don't know Christ like you are right now. As soon as you're out of high school, in fact, if I did a poll right now at all of our locations of the adults, of how many people, how many lost people you know, I bet you probably would have a hard time filling up a half sheet of paper. That's how we are as Christians. We just kind of get in our bubble. We got our Christian friends, and we don't really interact with people who do not know Jesus. And for people who are in college and people who are in high school, there will never be a time in your life where you have the opportunity that you have now. You're not just a student. You don't just have to wake up on Monday morning and say, oh, you can be an ambassador for Christ. You might hate your job. Guess what? You have a new purpose. You're a witness to God's grace, to the people around you that don't know him. See, when you understand your eternal perspective and your identity in Christ and that it dictates what you should do for Christ, everything changes. Paul was called to the Gentiles. J.W. Tucker was called to the Congo. And you're called to the people around you. The issue a lot of times is faith, right? Do we believe in God? Do we believe God is who he said he is? And do we believe, almost as important, Do we believe that God 
what he says about us is true? And are we going to act on it? I love these two quotes talking about faith. I'm going to leave you with these and then we're going to close in prayer. If you guys can put up that first quote, talking about faith that says, when we operate on faith, we aren't risking our reputation. We're risking God's reputation. And God can handle himself just fine. And then it says, if God has called you, you aren't really doubting yourself. Don't miss this. You're doubting God. And then talking about you know, being a church of ambassadors, I, I love this quote. The true measure of a church isn't the seating capacity of its sanctuary. The true measure is its sending capacity, which you might not go to Senegal, and that's fine. I mean, I think that's important, but you, most of our church is not going to go to Senegal. But every single Sunday, you come in here into God's presence, and that's how kind of what we think of church. It's like being in this building, these four walls, and only in, in, in our K2. We're in God's presence, and, and then when we leave the building, woo <laughs> We're out of God's presence. We just live however we want. And that's not true. The, the truth of the, the gospel is this, and the truth of being an ambassador is this, that you gather in God's presence, but you take that presence with you wherever you go to be an ambassador to the people that God is putting your path. And that's the true strength of a church. I think the, the statistics are pretty pathetic when you look at the number of Christians who actively shared their faith. And it doesn't need to be with a megaphone. It doesn't need to be with a pulpit. It's just that subtle sharing your faith, serving Christ, serving other people, praying for opportunities to, to put grace into other people's life. The percentage of Christians that actively do that is really, really low. And it really just tells you as the body and our culture how we've mistaken our own identity. Because if we truly knew who we were, we would know what to do. So, Go. Not now, but you'll go this week and you'll have opportunities and you'll have people in your path and you can have a conversation, you could write a note, you can have a cup of coffee, you can even invite someone to church this week. There'll be plenty of opportunities. I'm pretty sure as I preach this that God will probably ordain those opportunities in your life and it'll be amazing. You'll just be like, oh, well, that's what we were talking about on Sunday. And you'll have a decision at that point to do what you were called to do or go back into a lack of faith. And my hope is that you'll remember that when those moments happen, you're not really doubting yourself. You're doubting the God who called you to it, the God who lives inside of you. And if he's called you to do something, he'll see you through it. Amen? I want to invite the, the worship teams to come forward at uh, all of our locations. And, you know, we don't always do a benediction. I'm not a benedictorial type of guy a lot of times, but I did come across, this is actually one of the benedictions that Mark Batterson's church does every week. And I thought it would be appropriate today to, to share this. And so with, with that said, would you guys please all stand? And uh, let me just speak this over our church. When you leave this place, you don't leave the presence of God. You take his presence with you wherever you go. And all God's people said, amen. amen.